for this shiuch. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I hope you're all well and keeping well and keeping safe. Um, while we're still in this lockdown, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us and our communities, uh, especially our vulnerable. Um, so we, we, we touched on last week um, about Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, his, his, his views on, um, you know, about the, the creation of the world and, and how he differed with the mutakallimun. And I didn't get a chance to go through uh, the, the hermeneutics of Hujjat al-Islam. So that's what I hope to cover in this session today in the next hour or so. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I want to backtrack a bit because I think I may not have covered the Rukun al-Sabir and that's quite important. Um, so I want to go through that then I'm going to start Rukun al-Thamin and then we're going to hopefully um, go through some of these discussion points because this is still the issue that we're going to look at now is still the most one of the most perennial issues um, theological issues within Islamic theology, basically, and philosophical theology, and it is also it is also one of the deep fault lines that divides theological groups. So whether you're of the Salafi persuasion, whether you're a Yathari, or whether you're of a Kalami persuasion, so whether you ascribe to the school of Imam Abu Hassan Al Ash'ari. Imam Abu Mansur al or or any of those who follow in their in their methodology, um, then this is a this is a dividing line, um, and unfortunately, as we know, the the dividing line, the fault line, is like an enemy's fault line. Um, one side is one camp, another side is another camp, and even though the never the twain shall never meet, um, even if they're not going to meet or reconcile the intellectual differences even the hearts are not being reconciled so it's a very it's just a very divisive um, topic um, but all we can do really is go through how Hujjat al-Islam is presented in the Risal al and what are the presuppositions guiding that particular view some of it we've covered already and we're going to see it reiterated in both Arukun al-Sabi and Arukun al-Thamin so those that's the outline there so we go through a rukun because i didn't go through i didn't go through the implications of the concept of direction so i want to do that quickly because that does link directly to the next part which is allah sitting on the throne because that's directly related to the issue of jihad um so after we look at that inshallah we'll look at a rukun so we're looking at we're going to look at literalism and ta'wil then we're going to try and look at Ghazali's theory of signification. What are the levels of being or what are the levels of which a word can refer to? Then his Qanun al-Ta'wil. Um, and then his duality of meaning, his Zahir and Batin. And whether that dichotomy of meaning um, is something justifiable. Is it something Ismaili influenced? Um, so what's going on? So what's going on with this Zahir and Batin issue, yeah? So some of our discussion points could be, and of course, alhamdulillah, because of your contributions, you know, many of you are far more well-versed than me in this. Um, you know, these discussion points may be what arise. Maybe, maybe they won't. Maybe they won't. Okay. Uh, let's get started. So... In, in Al Asr al Sabi', as you can see there on the screen, the Hujjat al Islam he mentions that uh, having you know done a whole via negativa, having said what Allah isn't, he continues by saying that Al Ilm bi Anna Allah Taala munazzahu munazzahu Dhat an al Ikhtisas bil Jihad. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala's uh, the, the, the next knowledge we're supposed to have, the seventh um, foundation is بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَلَى مُنَزَّهُ الذَّاتِ عَنِ الْإِخْتِصَاصِ بِالْجِهَادِ فَإِنَّ الْجِهَةِ إِمَّا فَوْقَ وَإِمَّا أَسْفَلْ وَإِمَّا يَمِينَ وَإِمَّا شِمَالِ 
or imma qudam or imma khalf. So then he says, this is the important thing. The line here he says, وَهَذِهِ الْجِهَادِ هُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَهَا وَأَحْدَثَهَا بِوَاسِطَةِ خَلْقِ الْإِنسَانِ so the reason why we get direction, directionality is only the case, is only a fact subsequent to an object being created like human beings. It doesn't even have to be human being, it could be any created entity. Why is khalaqalahu tarfain? So one why? Because then he goes on to explain, isn't it? That one of the uh, Allah's created two 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 directions or two uh, areas, the top and the bottom, two ends, you could say. So ahaduhuma ya'tamidu ala al-ard wa yusamma riglan. So one of the ends is that which relies on you know being on the earth, and they call that the feet. Yeah. Well, akhar yuqabiluhu. The other is obviously opposed to that. We we say marasan, and the other end, the other taraf, is the head, the top. And then, how do we define above the direction above? The direction above is just entailed by the fact that an object has a head or a top, or a pinnacle or a peak. That taraf entails aboveness is defined by that entailment of an object having a top. Yeah. So then he says, below is just defined as the fact that an object has a taraf that is downwards, i.e., the, the feet. So it just, so by definition, the reason why we get above and below is because we have a created entity that has a magnitude, that's finite, has a boundary, has a magnitude. So we get below, above, and then we get, then he says, وَخَلَقَ الْإِنسَانِ الْيَدَيْنِ وَأَحَدْهُمَا أَقْوَى مِنَ الْأُخْرَى فِي الْغَالِبِ um, And then he says, the, the fact that we have a, a right-hand side means then we have that direction. The fact that we have a left-hand side means we have that direction to the right and to the left. Um, and then we have going forward and going backwards or before and behind and in front and that that is because we have movement can you see so so the point here is and in paragraph it says insan. so the fact of the human beings being temporally originated the fact that the contingent beings just entails that they're going to have direction Um, if human beings were not created in this way, with this nature, with this khilqa, so if Allah were not to create, so definitely you wouldn't have had these directions if Allah hadn't created human beings with the particular nature that they have. Then he says, okay, if this is the case, if if directionality only arises or only entailed by the fact that human beings are created a certain way, um, then the then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the way he is, Jalla wa ala, um, it's impossible that these direct these concepts, directionality, apply to him because they arose purely out of the nature and the reality and the metaphysical fact. Of, of human beings so this is this is a metaphysical issue it's not a logical issue yeah i.e we're talking about the nature of something and what the nature of something entails so these are metaphysical issues it's nothing to do with mantik here yeah there's nothing illogical about the following proposition allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's nothing illogical there's nothing illogic if we put that into a proposition that makes that you know any problematic there's nothing problematic from the monetary side what we're talking about here is metaphysics i.e from the nature of things so when we say um a metaphysical fact or 
something is, is metaphysically the case, we are talking about how something is given the way the nature of that object is. So, so if these are haditha, if jihad are haditha, i.e. they are temporally originated, then um, they cannot be applied to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So applying the concept of above and below imply is only meaningful based on the fact that there is a head and, and, a, and feet. But Allah doesn't have a head and doesn't have feet, Jalla wa ala. So he doesn't, have a, he, he doesn't have a left to him, doesn't have a right to him. He doesn't have a left hand, doesn't have a right hand. In, that, in the way the human beings, he spelled out in terms of human beings. So if he doesn't have these properties, these physical properties, then direction, directionality doesn't apply to him. Uh, Doc, we have a question. Yeah. Oh, go on. Yeah, Fadl. Dr. Shah is asking, contingency doesn't entail temporary. Temporary. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think, you know, we, we didn't, we didn't, what we're just saying, though, is that when we're using contingency, we just mean we're taking the mutakallimu's term to say that it, it's a possibly existent thing. So what you find in the definition is um, the, the, the modality is also put into the, the modality, i.e. whether it's possible or necessary, is also put into the definition with how the thing came about. So temporar temporality and contingency are put together for the mutakallimun. Can you see? Um, whatever an object, because because every object, if it's possibly existent, if if it came in, existent in time, sorry, is a possibly existent thing. So every temporally originated thing is a contingent thing. Yeah. Generally, generally. So we're just using them interchangeably, even though there is a philosophical nuance um, on this issue. But definitely anything that comes to be the mutakallim will say in time is a contingent object, is a contingent entity because um, it had a cause for its existence. So it's a mumkin al-wujud. All right. So going back to the directionality issue. So if this is the case, then applying to Allah, applying all this to Allah subhanahu wa taala is وَكُلُّ ذَلِكَ مِمَّا يَسْتَحِيلُ فِي الْعَقْلِ. It's impossible rationally that all this applied to Allah subhanahu wa taala. Um, so, um, if it's impossible for Allah subhanahu wa taala, then Allah is not in any direction. It's not in any direction. And then um, this is where he he then begins. His eighth uh, foundation, a discussion of the eighth foundation, and then he kind of dovetails it, kind of dovetails it for us quite nicely when he says um, that what about when people say, well, and this is at the this is at the bottom of section seven. Let me just show you where it is. Oh, I think I've gone too far. Uh, let me see. Oh, here it is. Um, where does he say it from the text? Yeah, yeah, a little triceratops, take that. Right, so, where are we? Um, I'm trying to find it on the text on the screen. Something about the dua being, uh, something about the heavens being the qibla to dua. I think it's somewhere down here at the end. Let me have a look. Uh, Yeah, so he says here, it's down at the bottom. And so this is given us a already he's given us a sort of a link into what he's going to mention now in the eighth foundation that when we say that that what about when we raise our hands into the into the heavens when we do dua well that's because the direction of the dua is is the qibla to dua is the heavens just like the qibla to salah is the kaaba musharrafa 
Um, but obviously Allah is above everything in terms of his power and dominion and so on. So that dovetails nicely into what we're going to say now. Now, having said all this, having said all this, of course, you know, not everyone accepts this because obviously once you, you deny directionality to Allah, what do you then make of the issues mentioned in the Quran about, you know, Allah descending um, and things like that? So obviously that's what we're going to come to now. Let me just pause there if there's any questions or comments you want to chip in. And then, you know, and then we'll we'll go on to al uh, asl al-thamin. Um, if anybody has any questions, just... I, I had a... I don't know if it's... But it's the idea that, for example, in the Mi'raj, isn't there an idea that there was like a staircase to the heavens, literally? Yeah. And then in terms of like the dua, when the Prophet was receiving revelation, he'd always look to the heavens in anticipation. And, and I think that... This sort of like fitri argument that we are automatically inclined towards upwards direction. So is Imam Ghazali saying here that the, the upwardsness is a metaphor for Allah's elevated status, or, or what is he what is he saying? Well, how do we understand yeah, that? Yeah, in terms of yeah, because, yeah, because yeah, um, because if you want to take it from that, obviously the fitri interpretation would be you know man's instinct. It's part of his instinct is always to revere and, and know his own mortality and weakness. So he looks to something greater than himself. And often that is expressed not looking downwards, but it just seems to be looking upwards. Um, but remember, this is purely from just an aqli discussion. We're not even looking at naqli, what in terms of Islam mi um, and, uh, and issues like that. Now looking towards the heavens, yeah. So what I, what I understand Hujjah al-Islam to be saying is that Allah's dwelling place is not the heavens. Mm. You see, he's not there in the heavens, just like he's not dwelling, Jalla wa'ala, in the Kaaba Musharrafah. Well, we, yeah, so, but it's a, um, it's not just symbolic, it's not the word that I want to use, but that direction is just something that is representing the ulu and the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to looking upwards. Um, so it's a signifier to his greatness um, rather than it being a reference to his abode or where he is, Jalla wa ala. I'm trying to explain that again. I think the the, um, the Qibla to dua idea is not that Allah is literally above because obviously he's just negated that, but representatively um how do we sh how do we acknowledge the greatness of allah in that way what is looking upwards something like that something like that come back if it's not clear so allah's greatness jalala has to be represented in some way for us when we're supplicating so the direction is is towards the heavens uh, another thing like the idea of um, the jihad are developed after by human beings they are had as a concept um, afterwards. Yes, they only become like, meaningful once you have a a, a, a hadith, a, a finite temporal entity that's come into being. Um, otherwise, before that, well, there was no there was no concept of that. If we're going to define in the way that Hujjat al Islam has defined these directions, exactly. Yeah, okay, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. So the fact that you have a head or a peak means there's an above. The fact that you have something that plants you on the earth, on the ground, means there's a below. The fact that you have sides means there's towards this way and there's towards that way. The fact that you have front and behind, before and after, in, you know, are entailed by the fact that the object has movement, things like that. So from the nature, the metaphysical, from the metaphysical fact of human beings, we get directionality. Yeah. And if you said if you were just a ball. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. If you were just a ball, then, you know, None of that would happen. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But, but I think there's like can't. major implications in terms of like philosophy of language and development. But I don't want to go there. Yeah, that's like definitely, definitely. Even in when we look at um, to Sam's theory of signification, his Qanun al Ta'wil, all that has an assumption about language and metaphysics. Um, now, that hasn't been spelt out yet in the literature properly, which you know, hopefully, hopefully it gets done and it needs to be done because philosophy of language. 
within Kalam, within Islamic philosophy in general, is just one of the most underrepresented areas of research. Um, you know, so, you know, so it, it, it's, it's a tricky area because obviously Ghazali wants to affirm, as we're going to look at, he wants to affirm that these things have a madlul, they have a sense. Uh, you can understand what the terms fawq, taht, yeah, shimal, you can see what all these mean, but when it comes to Allah, do they have a, do, do they refer, do they pick out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Well, this is where it gets tricky. Yeah. Um, if anybody else if you say it picks, yeah. um, just put it in the comments if you want to ask, otherwise. Definitely, definitely. Um, Everybody seems all right, quiet so, today. Alhamdulillah. Right. So now it gets so given this. So the reason why he puts this directionality discussion first is because it now relates directly to al asl of thamin. So the eighth foundation now is directly relates to this discussion about jihad. Why? Because he says al asl of thamin al ilm. So the eighth foundation is that we must have knowledge al ilm bi annahu taala mustawin ala al arsh al arshihi. بالمعنى الذي أراد الله تعالى بالاستواء وهو الذي لا ينافي وصف الكبرياء ولا يتطرق إليه سمات الحدوث والفناء وهو الذي أريد بالاستواء إلى السماء حيث قال في القرآن and then he gives the ayah so the next knowledge we've got to have is what that he is مستوين على العرش he is استواء on his arsh Whatever that whatever that istawa means. But then he says, Bilma'ana alladhi aradahu ta'ala bil istiwa. So Hujjah Islam is saying, okay, we, we have to have knowledge of that Allah is on his arsh in the meaning that he intended the istiwa to be. Um Wahuladhi La Yunafi Wasfal Kibriya Wulaya Satabu Ilayhim. Okay, so see where are we now on that line? Yeah, so so then he says the ayah thumma stawa ila samai wa hiya dukhan. And then he says wa that wa laysa dhalika illa bi tariq al qahr wal istila. Kama qala shair qad istawa bishr ala al Iraq min ghayri saf min ghayri saif wa dam al mihraq. So he gives example here. Look, it cannot be Allah's intent cannot be anything other than Allah's murad cannot be anything other than um, in the meaning of to overpower and to dominate and establish like his authority. Then he gives the, the poetry example that Bishr, you know, conquered Iraq without you know, without a sword, without spilling any blood, without raising a sword or spilling any blood. Um, but it must mean that because he says afterwards, um, um, and then he says, it has to be taken. We're compelled to take that meaning because if we don't, then we're gonna then we then we're compelled then we're gonna compelled to to accept that Allah has some kind of encompassing or Allah's encompassed or you know he's he, something um, is below him or something like that. So these di this directionality that's implied by if we take it literally is impossible. Um, because he says below, um, he says, فكذا, I'll, I'll explain the other example just a bit. He says, فكذا الاستواء لو ترك على الاستقرار والتمكن If we accept it as being Allah sitting or settling on the throne, or you know, sort of placing himself on the throne like a king does on his throne, لَلَزِمَ مِنْهُ كَوْنُ الْمُتَمَكِّنْ جِسْمًا مُمَاسًا لِلْعَرْشِ so that will imply that will imply that the the person sitting doing the sitting is like a body touching the touching the throne um and that implies you know something big in bigger or smaller 
وذلك محال and his qaida is ma yu'addi ila al-muhal fa huwa muhal that's his principle so whatever leads to an impossibility is itself must be an impossibility um so for him then this this sitting on the throne it cannot be anything other than then the it cannot be the literal meaning because if, if it was a literal meaning then we're going to get the implications of directionality that he just mentioned in al-asl al-sabi' and obviously he mentioned from al-asl al-thani ila asl al-sadis that Allah is not a body he's not an accident he's not in he's not he doesn't have a form he doesn't have the absolute absolute negation of Allah being anything Allah is creation but if we were to take it literally him sitting on the throne then what we what what we're led to is a muhal is an impossibility which is Allah having being entailed by directionality so having a below something being beside him and then him being encompassed or whatever so that can't be possible um and if that's not possible then what do we do we must move to um a figurative interpretation and I'll try and break down his theory in just a second so he gives other examples there what about that the what, what about us taking the the, the hadith of qalbu mu'min the heart of the believer is between the two fingers asba'i min asabi rahman and then he says this is you know indicating allah's qudra and his qahr um his power and his you know his dominion um what about al hajar al aswad yamin allah fi ardihi and then he says, well, this is an instance of not to be taken literally, but an indication of of, of the the tashrif, the, the, the honorific status of the, uh, the Hajar al-Aswad. That's phrased in that term, it being the right hand of Allah on the earth. Um, because he says, لِأَنَّهُ لَوْ تُرِكَ عَلَى ظَاهِرِهِ لَلَزِمَ مِنْهُ الْمُحَالِ so if, we, if we were to take these narrations as the heart of the believer in the two things between the two fingers of the most most merciful if we were to literally accept that if we were to literally accept um that the hazard of aswad is allah's right hand on the earth then we're let we're, we're led to a muhal we're led to an impossibility about allah um and whatever leads to an impossibility is itself impossible now obviously i'm going to go through some objections that people raised about even that qaida itself yeah um but can you see how he dovetails his discussion about directionality in Al Asl Al Sabi' with Al Asl Al Thamin? So, with the eighth foundation. So, that's his basic outline in the Risala Qudusiyya. We take, we can't take words in the Zahid sense if they lead to something Muhal. I remember going back to what are the presuppositions guiding Hujjat al Islam's theology in general, let alone his hermeneutics. One reason, reason defines the scope of what is meaningful and what is not meaningful. In other words, reason doesn't abrogate re revelation. He doesn't. He doesn't accept that. Rather, what he stresses is that um, reason um, delineates what is acceptable and what is unacceptable to take from the language of revelation so reason defines the scope of what's possible and what's not possible to take that's the first thing the second thing of course is um he's already he's already laid out his metaphysics anything that implies um contingency or anything that implies you know hudus you know temporalness um that is impossible because Mala Yahlu min al Hawadith for Hua Hadith. Remember that principle? Whatever is not can't be uh, cannot be bereft of temporal originations or changes, then that thing itself is a changing substance or a changing object. And that's impossible when it applied to Allah. So already his metaphysical presuppositions, his epistemological presuppositions the, the 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 optimism in the intellect to be able to delineate the scope of what revealed language what are the possibilities in revealed language um the uh, and things like that are coming into play so before we go on to look at his principles in a little bit 
any questions on that? I mean, that's the outline of the Risala Qudusiya. He doesn't give you his Qanun Ta'wil here. He doesn't give you his um, his theory of signification. He doesn't give you his theory of um, you know his hermeneutical rules and things like that. So what he's trying to say in quite simple terms is Allah is established on the throne in the manner that he's intended it to be without that implying in any way contact um, settledness, istiqrar, tamakkun, i.e. positioning yourself, hulul, incarnation or indwelling, change of location, intiqal, and all this entails further that um, he is denying tashbih, i.e. likening Allah to creation in, in, in a literal sense, and is negating tajseem or corporealism, which is like making Allah body like or physical. Or the concept of God or Allah as being like a physical being. So he, he's, he's, he's negating both these things. Um, um, and the principle, as I mentioned, is مَا يُؤَدِّي إِلَى muhal, فَهُوَ muhal. And so he wants to uphold, he wants to uphold literalism, the ad literatum. He wants to up uphold the zahir. He wants to do that. Um, but there are times when reason circumvents the text. So reason um, dictates when the text can't be taken in that way. Um, and so we have to resort to a non-literal interpretation. And that's called ta'wil. You don't have to call it ta'wil. You can call it whatever you want. Yeah? But you know, in the literature, that's known as ta'wil. And finally, um, it's interesting because obviously he's not adopting Imam al Ash'ari's Bila Kaifa method. Um, so, you know, he's he's very clearly moved away from that Bila Kaifa sort of approach. Um, because the Bila Kaifa, Bila Kaifa doctrine, that, that doctrine, part of accepting what that doctrine assumes is, or states is that when you take the literal meaning of something about Allah, a description about Him, His Sifa or qualities, Whatever it might be, um, you accept it, and you accept it at the same time. But God having it, but not having it in a way, but He has it in a way unlike His creation. Um, and obviously, Imam Al Ashari did that. He adopted the Bilal Kaifa um, because he wanted to accept the literal wording without having to to do metaphorical interpretation without having to do allegorical interpretation. But Ghazali rejects this because um, he, he doesn't think the Bila Kaifa approach renders any word meaningful. For him, it's almost nonsensical. Because when you say, oh, Allah has hands or eyes or whatever, but they are unlike any eyes that were created or any created eye or created hand, then what you've in, in effect done is You've 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 rendered it nonsensical now. You've not given you've not rendered it meaningful. Um, so Bila Kaifa doesn't allow Ghazali to do the the proper hermeneutical maneuvers that he wants to make. Um, and why he wants to make them, we'll come back. To, we'll come to later. But uh, he does. He moves away from the Bila Kaifa doctrine because, um, like I said, it doesn't make sense to say Allah has these descriptions, but they're not like descriptions in. In anything in creation, so it's like Allah has X, but not like anything, but not like an X in creation. That doesn't mean for him that doesn't mean anything, um, because it doesn't make sense to say something is a yad, but then you then say at the same time it's unlike any yad that is or might be. You know, you've just taken away the meaning of yad from it. If you say same thing with I or whatever, whatever other quality. Um, if you if you say Allah has this quality, but then you take that away from Him by by assuming that that quality is not like any other quality of a created thing, then in effect you're not ascribing it to Allah in any way, in any meaningful way. All right, let me pause there because I've said quite a lot. I know we're coming up to the hour, and I'm wondering I want to get started on this uh, hermeneutical rule, but I don't mind if we go slow on this because it's quite important anyway. Doc, this Bila K position of Imam al Ashari, it sounds a lot like the Salafi position. Well, it is, yeah. It is, yeah. Oh, wow, okay. 
interesting. That is that you know. Uh, you see that the, the problem is right. We've got this little joke, yeah. We've got this little joke, and is that you know we we, we say the the Mu'tazila were they affirmed al manzila bain al manzilatain, right? They accepted a position between two positions when it comes to like sinners and things like that. But what we then see is in 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 al ashari theology, we see a lot of manzila bain al manzilatain. It's a position between two positions. Kasb is like that, the, the sifat is like that. So we see them trying to straddle a middle position. And it becomes become a bit of a caricature. Like, oh, it's, it's the Ash'ari middle position again, between two extremes. Where the middle position always and isn't necessarily always the most robust position, can you see? But anyway, that was just a little little reference in there, a little, little lame calamic joke. But but yeah, you're right. The Bila Kaifa, Imam Abu Hassan al Ash'ari, is not really anything substantially different from, substantially, substantively different from Imam Ahmed's one. There are, there is nuance. There is nuance. Um, I can't remember what year it was. I think Imran and I on, in white, on White Thread in the course, we covered, we covered it quite a bit. The Sifat in Bila Kaifa. I've got about a few handouts on there, which I'll try and dig out and then sort of send it to you guys. I put Mona it in the is asking, was the Bilal Kaif Imam Ash'ari's final position? I don't know, you know. I, I think it is. I think it is. I don't think, because in because he mentions it in Maqalat al-Islamiyyin. So unless, I, I, I don't know, I mean, our Ash'ari scholars, Mona Awais is better versed in this than me, but our Ash'ari scholars w would probably know better. I think, you know, I, my personal view is he never abandoned it. Yeah, so basically, um, I, I know this is a huge discussion uh, and um, about Imam Ash'ari and mm. Bila Kaif versus the Ta'wil. So, yeah, yeah. in Al Ibana, yes, it's Bila Kaif because uh, he explicitly uh, mentions that he's on the position of Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. But then in subsequent works, like, like Kitab al Luma, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. find the the ta'wil. So this, like, definitely, definitely, becomes, uh, if you like a mystery or conundrum for subsequent scholars to talk about it. What <sighs> seems to be the case, as far as I remember, when we were studying this, is that um, Imam Ash'ari through the Ibana wants to appeal to the to the Hanbalis, to the Hanabil, exactly. To the that's Hanabil. right. That's right. That's and right. Then, uh, in al Luma, he's having a more internal discussion. Hence, he's open to ta'wil. So, wallahu <laughs> alam. Like, this this is what I, I remember looking. You're at. right. You're right about that. Same as the istihsan al-khawd fi ilm al-kalam, where he he you know he, he's also obviously defending kalam, and he's very more like a mutakallim in these works. Um, the problem is, you see, if we take the view that he tried to appease like Imam al barbahari for example, mm -hmm. or uh, in, in Baghdad because he you know he got scared of the Hanabila and he's going to be driven out. Of the the ilmi majalis and, and and things like that, then then we have to make an impl inference about the character of Imam Abu Hassan Al Ashari, that he's going to be duplicitous. He's going to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't think it, it was as far as like um, it was for money or for power. It just it made sense in, in like if you look yeah. at uh, who was it Qadi Iyad and others who talk mm. about a relationship between the. Erul Hadith and and the and, and the Ashaira, how yeah. gradually kind of levitated towards him, and what they saw in him, or at least parts of what they saw in him that they wanted to keep, and other parts they, they didn't really want to talk about. I think, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But the problem is when when you look at when you look at uh, Imam Al Ashari's Tawi though, it's very few though. I mean, he doesn't do it. Yeah, and he doesn't go alatul Tawi. He doesn't go like you know. Tawil overdrive, where there, there, where he felt that that uh, from Lugha and other reasons, he, he he does it definitely. But I don't know if he just if I just feel I don't you know there's not enough evidence for whether he abandoned the Bila Kaifa as a as a general position. Allahu alam. I mean, you're right, man. It's a big issue. But in later works, he's proper mutakallim. He's on mutakallim drive mm -hmm. um like a luma um but the problem is if you look at maqalat al-islamiyin he has an aqidah in there okay. 
Yeah, he has an aqidah text in there. Yeah, it's been translated by what, I think, in his creeds. And that's supposed to be a reconciliatory creed. So what what could be going on is that Imam al-Ash'ari, he knows about the, the two different tensions here in the two different camps. And he wants to get some kind of middle ground. Um, and that aqidah in the maqalat islami is supposed to do that. Um, but in it, it's just like a Hanbali creed, if you read it generally. It doesn't say, you know, it doesn't mention Tatwil in there that we, we resort to figurative. It didn't differentiate it from like other generic creeds. It's like a Tahawi creed, basically. Mm. Um, so if you look at the Maqalat Islami, yes, that was, uh, so that's one other evidence. So you're right, someone's got to put it all together. Now, I wouldn't read Al Ash'ari if we later. Al-Sha'ira, Al-Hujjat Islam, obviously he doesn't accept Bilal Kaif. Maybe even Furaq we can use, yeah. but again... I'll, I'll tell you, would you, would you not like, so in the absence of all this, would you not read to someone like Ibn, Ibn, Ibn Furaq, Baqillani and the early, early Al-Sha'ira? Of course, not the later ones, because we know that um, they took up a different position. Or... We would have to consider that, and we, we should, we would have to consider that. Um, but the problem is Ibn Furaq then turns Al-Sha'ri into something else. Um... <laughs> So that's the thing, you see, how much is it filtering? So but it's about tarjih, isn't it? It's about what you're going to do, what you, how, which, inter which sources are you going to prefer over other sources? Are you going to use the imam's texts themselves that we have? Or how he's been filtered through his students or students of students? Um, but definitely you won't get Imam al-Ash'ari's view directly from Hujjat al-Islam. Definitely not. That's my opinion. But isn't it fair to say this, though, that... Um the Ash'ari position as a whole, subsequent to Ash'ari, has been towards the Ta'wil side and not the Bilal. Definitely, definitely. In complete contrast to what like some of the more Salafi kind of uh, camps would like to argue that the Ibana is the final word and that's it. Like Imam Ash'ari did Tawbah, Bilal Kaif and... Yeah, yeah. yeah. The problem is with the Ibana about the authenticity, you know, there's a lot of discussion about it. I think on the whole, it's attributable to Imam Abu Hassan Ash'ari. The problem is, he's doing the tahqiq, he's trying to, to ascertain them what are the interpolations, if there are any. And clearly, apparently, according to the scholars, there are. Um, but the Ibana, as a, as a text generally, is attributed to Imam Al Ash'ari. But which edition is the most authentic one? I mean, that's, that's, I don't think that question has been settled, but you're right about the, the, the Salafis who say there's a conversion to Imam Ahmad's mm -hmm. view. Yeah, yeah. Everyone converted to Imam Al Ahmad's view, according to the Salafis, right? All the Ashairah, all the great luminaries like Al Razi, Al Juwaini, Hujjat, they all converted to the Manhaj of Imam Ahmad, radiallahu an, according to these reports. So it's tricky. It's tricky. But in terms of Hujjat al Islam, he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to resort to Ta'wil unless, as we're going to go through, maybe we'll run out of time, but. As I want to look at, he, unless you have a Burhan to go to the Ta'weed. Um, but my view is, generally, I don't think Imam Abu Hassan Ash'ari left Bilal Kaif. He didn't. Uh, I don't know. I haven't got enough knowledge on how to fully justify that. But on my basic reading, mm -hmm. I, I think he kept to the Bilal Kaif. His, his, his version of the Bilal Kaif. Um... As well as Tatwil, yeah. Uh, Doc, um, <coughs> Imran has a question. Fadda, Fadda Imran, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I'm stuff. just to drill down the concept of Bilal Kaif, could you maybe elaborate mm. upon you know, the different types of Tafweed? So Tafweed Ma'anawiya, Tafweed Kaifiya. So obviously when we say Salafiya, they have an understanding of Bilal Kaif in a particular way, isn't it? And then the ulama of the Ashara, when they say Tafweed or Bilal Kaif, they understand it in a slightly different way. So... Could you maybe drill down and discuss the underlying issue of tafweed? And but the, you know, the, the issue of yeah, yeah. But the issue of tafweed. Okay, in terms of the bilal kaif, I mean, um, what the bilal kaif versions try to do is say, okay, look, we want to take the descriptions of Allah, um, but what does the without howness, without modality mean? Um, so it means that. Um, you want to. You don't want to take metaphysical discussions about God. You don't want to delve. You want to. You want to go down that route. You want to shut down 
any further questioning about Allah's attributes and his qualities. You don't want to use reason in matters of nas because that's not the scope for the aql to operate in because you're in nas now. You're not you're not outside of the nas. Yeah, you're not dealing with the waqa, you're dealing with the nusus. And the other thing that Bilal Kaifa tried to do was they wanted to follow in the footsteps of tradition. So those are the four aspects. When you look at Bilal Kaifa, those are the four aspects to bear in mind all the time. They don't want to do tatwid, they don't want to do allegorical interpretation. The Bilal Kaifa is to shut down any further questioning on Allah's attributes, um, to avoid using the aql to speculate in matters of nusus, especially the ghaybiyat, and and to to not to break away from the authority, i.e. the salaf in this particular case. So given these four aspects in mind, the Bila Kaifa stances vary according to the different scholars, um, according to their own particular account. So Abu Ubaid al-Qasim bin Salam, he has a Bila Kaif. Ibn Qutayba, he has a Bila Kaif. Imam Ahmad, he has a Bila Kaif stance. Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, he has a Bila Kaif stance. Now, in terms of um, uh, the tafweed issue, the question is: is then you know what are you what are you doing tafweed of? Are you, what are you trying to say? Is your tafweed the following? Um, I I don't know what the meanings are of these ambiguous verses. I'm not going to delve into it. I don't have to delve into it. Um, I don't know what the meanings are going to be. I suspend judgment and I leave. I leave the right one to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Is your tafweed to say, um, I, I, I'm not going to bother interpreting these 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 attributes and and qualities of Allah that's come in these ambiguous verses, these mutashabihat verses. I leave the meaning to Allah. They have a meaning. I leave the meaning to Allah. Or your third one, similar to the second, I leave the meaning and whatever that entails. Um, only Allah knows the meaning, and these words don't really have a sense to them. The mutashabihat don't have a meaning. Um, that's that's fathomable. Allah knows, but we can never know what these meanings are. They're they're closed off to us. Or you say I. Give the meaning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever that meaning is, and there is a meaning. But one thing I would add is that this meaning is not literal. So the fourth one says, you leave the meaning to Allah. There is a meaning in these verses or these texts, but the meaning is not literal. And the third one was saying that you leave the meaning to Allah because it came from him. And we can never know what these meanings are. They're epistemically closed off to us. And then so on. So these are like the four different types of tafweed. And the, the tafweed can be in what the meaning of it is and what the modality of it is. But is the meaning and modality a, a difference with a distinction without a difference? Well, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's open to, to discussion um, because how you qualify something may, may fall under the meaning of that thing or it may not. So it depends on whether you, you, whether you look at a qualification of something, a statement, as falling under its ma'ana. If you do, then your 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 tafweed is going to be in everything. But if you don't put the qualification of something under the meaning of something, then the two are going to be separate for you. Um, sorry, Imran, come back on that. If, if... I think that last point is actually crucial. So you, it seems, from my understanding of it anyway, that you can clarify that Ibn Taymiyyah detaches meaning from the Hamas, doesn't he? So because he accepts a Zahid meaning, but he doesn't accept. Or it doesn't allude to the kafia, whereas the the ulama of the shal, at least, or some of the Ashish scholars, they accept. If you accept the meaning, then this automatically entails a hellness. So there's no kind of split between the two. Yeah, yeah. So you're right. So here, instead of ma'ana, they use the word madlul in the books of usul. So does it have a sense? So if I say to you the following sentence: um, My car is black and it's parked outside. Now, anyone who knows English and knows the meanings of these words can fathom what I've just said, right? I have a black car and it's parked outside my house. Now, um, you haven't seen the car. 
you don't know what type of black it is. You don't know how it's parked outside my, my house. You just understand the word parking, black, car, and they're meaningful. You can see. So they have a sense to you. They have a uh, mood. Quick second. If I could also tell them not to turn this mic off because I think they cannot. Um, so you have. So, uh, what was I was going to say, yeah. So you understood what I said, even though you didn't know the reality behind it, because you haven't come to my house to see what kind of black car it is. And I've, I haven't told you what car it is. I haven't told you what model. I haven't told you how it's parked, if it's bent on the curb, or whatever it is, right? But you understood what I said. So if you've understood what I said without knowing how it's been qualified, then that is sufficient. Um, and I think a lot of the the scholars, Ghazali definitely alludes to that like in al-mustaswa he says everything in the quran has a madlul has a sense even though you might not know the realities and the modalities of that are you of what those texts are referring to so when allah says a garden under which rivers flow they they have a madlul that makes sense to you the arabs didn't go uh what does uh mean tahti al-anhar mean is it in our language is it in some other language no they knew what it meant the madlul the meaning the signification even though they don't know the reality behind the river and how it flows because it's in jannah so so yeah so there's this whole thing that here that needs to be unpacked and you're right if they make a difference between ma'ana and 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 the modality or madlul and modality then you can have it both ways you can understand what Allah is saying without delving into what the actual reference is what the nature of the referent the referent is um so yeah something like that yeah Imran come back come back if you need to no the real reason I say is because when the Salafiya say that you know he mentioned the tradition of Imam Ahmed Imam Abbas Rashidi yeah 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 it wasn't to accept the literal meaning as far as I understand it it was basically to consign the meaning as you said earlier uh, and obviously, there is a whole conflation here in the debate and discussion about Villa Cave when the, the terms are not demarcated clearly enough in terms of the points of contention. So, the first point of contention would be the matna, would be the meaning. Then it would be the exactitude of it or the house of it. So, the example that you give of a car, yeah, if I say the word car, we know what a car is. But That's we right. don't understand the additional details of what the car looks like. We know what the, what the word car means. But if you apply this to the attributes, if I say the word X, in this sense, the, the scholars might say we don't even know what X means, let alone more details of it. Does that make sense? So it depends on how, de how you delve into the details. And then uh, it's just something that we, I think, elaborated a bit further in these kind of debates because um, it gets a bit confusing. Well, this is why I said, yeah, you're right. Well, this is why I said, what kind of tafweed are you, are you holding? Are you saying that I'm giving the meaning to Allah and we will never know what that meaning is? Because no. none of the scholars, majority of the scholars, I don't even think even Taymiyyah rahimahullah takes that view. Um, that, you know, we don't know, we never know what the meaning is. They all have a meaning. It's just, it's ambiguous to the listener. It's ambiguous to the Samir. But there is a meaning. It just means through Ishtihad, we can approximate the meaning. We can never get to the meaning because it's mutashabihat. It's dhanni. It's not qat'i. Because if it was qat'i, then it wouldn't be mutashabihat. It'd be muhkam. Um, so, but we can get it. Um, we can get to the meaning but the question is then is the meaning um is is once we've got the madlu the meaning do are we obliged to further go behind the reality of what it is so once we understand what yad is from the madlu sense from the linguistic sense like let's just say power or protection um that's it is that that's as far as we need to go or do we need to go into the metaphysical back backdrop and you see, um, you know, I don't think we have to. We only have to do that if you believe that everything you're going to ascribe to Allah is an attribute of Allah. Um, so every every description about Allah, as I said, every ascription you're making to Allah is a sifa of Allah. And Imam Ibn al-Jawzi said that's not the case. As we got with the Hajar al-Aswad, al-Hajar al-Aswad Yaminullah fi ardihi. So the Hajr al-Aswad is Allah's right hand on the earth. But what is this idafa indicating? For Hujjat al-Islam says it, it's idafa of tashrif. It's the idafa that ennobles you or makes you great. Um, an ikram. Not an attribute. It's not an idafa of a sifa. It's not an ascription denoting an attribute.
So all this stuff has got to be untangled properly. And, you know, but for Hujjat al-Islam, generally we take the Zahir, unless we have a reason to go from the Zahir, and he mentions the Risala Qudusiyya, that anything that leads to an impossibility about Allah, we can't take that. So he uses a, what we call Qarina Aqliya. He's, he's using a rational clue to depart from the literal. Um, not everyone accepts that, of course, um, and we're going to look at that. So the qarina aqliya is that the by taking the literal script, by taking the zahir meaning, we're leading to Allah being corporeal or being like creation, but we don't want to do that. So in the case in the case of istiwa ala al arsh, we don't take al istiqrar wa tamakkun. We don't say Allah settled and and positioned. On the throne according to Hujjat al-Islam because, because being mutamakkin means you're a body, you're, you're a jism And he's already negated that Allah is a jism So any anything that involves touch That only applies to things that are bodies But Allah is not a body There's nothing below him, above him Bigger than him or smaller to him in a certain direction Bigger to him in a certain direction وَذَلِكَ muhal. وَمَا يُؤَدِّ إِلَى muhal فَهُوَ muhal. Can you see? So the aql now has delineated the scope of what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. So the revelation then is made um, subservient to the parameters set down by the aql. And not everyone accepted that. And, th and that was where that is where the big tension is. Does the aql have the right to delineate the parameters of the nusus? And that's a fundamental difference. You're not the, the Athari and the, the, the Mutakalimun are not going to meet here because they have two different assumptions that mutually exclude each other. Um, right, so let me pause there before we have any closing questions or comments. And again, uh, we will go through the theory of signification and Qanun al Ta'wil in our next lesson um, because I just forgot to do the, the Asal al Sabir before I got into Asal al Thamin because obviously the two are connected together and he's purposely put it there because it's structural talks about direction then the direction applies to the notion of istiwa um, so can you see that methodology here this is a mutakallim's methodology when it comes to understanding scripture that in a snapshot is how the mutakallimun approach these descriptions or qualities about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in general they resort to ta'weed um, but without adding any further but I mean, the, that is the meaning according to the Mutakallimun. That is the meaning of istiwa. It's not istiqrar, it's not tamakkun, it's qahr and it's qudra, or sorry, istila, or whatever it might be. However, however Hujjat al Islam has mentioned it here. So, that is in a nutshell how the Mutakallimun approach scripture. We take it on the literal, unless there's a reason not to take it on the literal. But what tells us? On what basis do we decide not to take it on the literal? We decide it based on the intellect telling us, our minds telling us, our mind which delineated the metaphysics. Um, that tells us that this is not this kind of reading is not possible. This reading is not possible. Remember, it's muhal. It's nope. It's not possible in any way. All right. Uh, Any other questions? Uh, I think more no ways. Oh yeah, for the mouse. For the. Oh, he's typing it. I mean. Oh okay. So, I'll, 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 yeah, I'll, I'll just um, I'll, I'll speak the message, the, the question. So the, you know, what you mentioned that um, it's the mind uh, that will decide. Yeah. Right or wrong. I was saying, but also the the language will have to play a part. Yeah, that's right. That's right. He doesn't mention it here, but that's if you use Qarina Nasiya, for example. Um, and obviously, your your Tatwil will have to be based on. Yeah, you're right. It has to be based on a an established usage of the Arabic language. Mm -hmm. that's, that's yeah, right. yeah, definitely, definitely. It can't be outside the Arabic the Arabic language. So we have to go to see how the Arabs used. Um, obviously, this has even more fundamental issues. Whether there is majaz, 
not just in the Quran, whether there is majaz in the in the, in the Arabic language. Because there are those who believe there is majaz in the Lugha, but there's no majaz in the Quran. There's no metaphor in the Quran. So some believe that there's no majaz in the Arabic language itself. So therefore it follows that there can't be majaz in the Quran. Um, but obviously the Mutakallimun believe there is majaz in the Arabic language and the Quran has come ala uslub al-Arab. So it's come in the styles of the Arab and so therefore it's got majaz in it. Yeah. This is a related point. It is related, but I don't know if if you want to address it now or maybe next lesson. So we are all aware of the uh, growth of ta'wil as a phenomenon in the Ashari school. Something that you you pointed out that um, by saying that the Imam Ashari didn't engage in the types of ta'wil or just uh, the amount of ta'wil that the latest scholars are making, do you think? Um, that the latest scholars who made ta'wil uh, did it because they believed in it or, or was it uh, something that was just a pure exercise that they were doing? I so, think I mentioned, yeah, I got sort of, sorry, 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 sorry. When Ghazali says that, look, you take the literal meaning, but if you can't take the literal meaning and it's, for example, troubling you in Tajsim yeah. terms or Tanzihi terms, then okay, just, mm. you know, that's it. So, was it something to do with this? My view is that, and so Hujjat al-Islam mentions this because he says that majority of the verses you're not going to need to do ta'wil on. They could be taken literally. And obviously in the tahafut he mentions how the things about the ba'ath and what's going to happen after life, these can be taken literally once you ex prove rationally that there is an afterlife. Um, so they don't have to be explained like Ibn Sina did, like allegorically. Um, so I think Hujjat al-Islam wants to retain ta'wil uh, and, and make that a part of the manhaj uh, uh, of, of reading the Nusus because he wants to allow for himself the room to be allowed to be able to do new interpretations. If you don't allow yourself scope for um, like you know, interpretation. If you don't have interpretive scope, you can't bring new interpretations in. You can't. Um, so I think one of his aims was um, he doesn't, He it's because of that. Because he also goes to defend, like, you know, the people say, and whoever interprets the hadith based on their ra'i, man qala fil Quran bi ra'ihi min he, 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 you know, he tries to interpret that in a way which says you can use your ra'i to justify interpretation of the Qur'an as long as there's dawabit. So he's doing it for a reason because, you know, because of what he does in Ihya and other places, he brings his own interpretation of things. Um, and he doesn't want to be beholden to an authority before him, which is what the Bila Kaifa was all about. You avoid ta'wil, Metaphorical interpretation, you you close off any discussion about Allah's attributes um, and all the, the other points that I mentioned. You know, you take it on authority and things like that. Where he is moving away from that and saying, no, you know, no, nope, we need room for interpretation. We need that dynamism. Um, and that's why he got the Zahid Batin distinction. Because um, you can always now say, okay, you understood that on the Zahid, but you haven't understood it on the Batin level. <laughs> Let me take you to the Barton level And you're like, okay I didn't know there was a Barton level Hujjat al-Islam But let me take you there So that he wants to He wants to So can you see how he's trying to open up The nuss to further, yeah, explore And he can only do that if he allows The possibility for that For Ta'wil to be there But he also doesn't want to He wants to avoid the Ismaili Bartani, yeah Ta'wil, because that's 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 a different level, man. That's like that's wacky stuff, yeah. Um, so you know, so he wants to put some tawabit there that differentiates it from his accusations of his enemies mm -hmm. that he was smuggling Ismaili ta'wil mm -hmm. into Sunni Islam. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's one of his aims. I personally feel now the mutakallimun later. Other than Hujjat al Islam, or before him and, and after him, after Imam al Ash'ari, I think it was just part of the manhaj of kalam. Mm -hmm. Because once you accept kalam metaphysics and you apply it to text now, mm -hmm. you're going to have to do ta'wil, you're going to have to do something.
Because mm -hmm. otherwise Allah comes to the heavens, Allah jogs, Allah laughs, mm -hmm. uh, Allah's foot is going to go on top of, of Nar, uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, <laughs> then you've got a massive, you got a massive body, isn't it? That's superhuman. Mm -hmm. Not even superhuman, it's like a powerful thing, but like a person. Um, so, yeah. I don't know. I, I may, maybe Imam Abu Hassan al Ashadi's ta'wil was moderate ta'wil. Maybe. I don't whatever that means. Um, I, I think it's a question of kamiya. Just mm, yeah, mm, mm. like I don't know. The, I, 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 like personally, I think it's it, it may have something to do with um, just the audience that mm. you know having to deal with. So, like, if if you're an Arab living yeah. in jazz then none of these are a problem. But if you're, for example, a convert from Buddhism yes. or Christianity, where all of these allegorical meanings have uh, anthropomorphic... Um, sure, sure. Hope, then, of course, you're going to have to counter this some way or another. So it's a pragmatic approach. So it's, prag it's a pragmatic approach because based on your audience and circumstance. Um, yeah, it's a possible way of looking at it, possible way. But I'd like to think it was probably more than just that. I'd like to think they did believe, you know, that language operates like that. And yeah, and, and, and it was, it was, and they, it was part of how Allah intended it to be. Um, Imam Ibn Jawzi mentions uh, brilliant reasons why Allah would use mutashabihat in Dafi' al Shubhat Tashbih. Um, <laughs> But then he was accused of being a, a Mu'tazili, rahimahullah, because um, of his hardcore ta'wil and his uh, hardcore rationalism. But uh, is it, I, I don't know. I, I tend to take the discussion not based on theology, but based on linguistics. Because mm -hmm. before all this discussion came about, there was a Sahaba and there was an Arabic language, isn't it? And then obviously there was... The, 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 you know, how the, the Arabs used their language before all this theological stuff came about. Mm -hmm. So then we, I, the way I look at it is we need to look at to see how, not how Imam al-Ahmad used it necessarily or Imam Abu hassan al-Ash'ari necessarily, but how did the Arabs use it? It's their language. Yeah, but I mean, the conflict that comes between the two sides is, is precisely on this, isn't it? That yeah, if, it's on the metaphysics though, yeah, because, yeah. Of the, uh, because of how it links to Allah. That's the point. If, if we take, for example, وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ Yeah. Right? So the um, even the Salafiyya will not have a problem in saying the Salaf made ta'wil on this, and therefore we accept it uh, on ta'wil. That's right. So, so why would we need to ask the further question? Right. So here, here's the thing. So mm. what, 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 what I'm understanding here is that whilst the Ashari Ramaturidiya took this as an asl, mm. to then as a precedent to then make further ta'wil, mm. they seem to be on the opposite side, saying this is an exception and, and not the norm. So if it's an exception, then it should remain an exception and we don't engage in ta'wil. Yeah, because because they, you have to, because the, the, the norm is you take the zahir in any language, even the Arabs, mm -hmm. unless there is a reason to go, um, even because that's how the Arabs, that's how the language tells you to do it. Because if we didn't take words and the zahir meaning, we can never communicate. Mm, of course. So there is that pragmatic function. If we didn't take the zahir, because if I say, if you didn't say to me, oh, Saf, can you close the door? And I'm like, well, I know it's, do you mean it literally or close the door on my career? Mm. What, what do you mean? You're like, shut the door, man. I call it close the door. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the literal meaning is how we, that's the qaida, how we normally would take words unless we have a reason to take those words. So I think, yeah, but uh, but but they did, they believed in majaz. They believed in majaz as part of the law. All the mutakallimun. Um, the thing is, as you know, isn't it, is the Mu'tazila problematized it a bit at the beginning mm. with the whole ta'wil in it. And then they went hardcore on ta'wil leading to denying that the reality behind Allah having these qualities. So Imam Abu Hassan al didn't want to do that. He didn't want to deny Allah of what he told, he informed himself about. Mm. So that's why he got the Bila Kaifa idea, how we developed it himself. Mm. Don't want to do the ta'wil like the Mu'tazila. But I also want to affirm that Allah's what He has affirmed of Himself. Um, so it's 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 a difficult thing. It's a difficult thing. This one because um, the metaphysics has been mixed with the language now. 
because it relates to Allah now. So, so yeah. Otherwise, you could just interpret it all based on lugha, on the language. How do the Arabs use? Let's look at the, how the uslub of the Arabs is when they make references like this. It's like when I say to you, oh, I'm wherever you are, don't worry, I'm with you. Or my thoughts are with you all the time. We have similar things in English. So we can explain it linguistically and um, without going in all, into all the metaphysics behind it. Um, and that, that's, all we, we, that's all we're required to do. But obviously, if, because of the Mutakalimun's approach, that's not enough because it has... Because they're coming at it from an akali angle. Um, yeah, I don't know, your thoughts. Tell me your thoughts. The thoughts are always important um, and helpful. Alhamdulillah, I think it's it's fine. Personally, like, um, I'm, as, as long as you can avoid tajseem and ta'adil, like, yeah, yeah. It's it's then a debate about what's the best way of articulating. Well, that, that's the whole mahal and isn't it? Yeah. That's the, how do you avoid the ta'adil? Because the Athalis would say, this is all ta'adil. Exactly. isn't it so and and but yeah sorry go on carry on carry on yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so like because the 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 opposition so the mutakalimi will say you guys are doing tajseem yeah? yeah that's right that's right thinking that regress in that sense it's, it's a you can't really get out of it unless like yeah yeah so what what we're gonna have to see is yes those people who are making supposedly making tajseem through the um, mm. through laser committee shay, through that mm. uh Yes, closer towards Tadsim, though not, inshallah, making Tadsim, mm, except mm. for a few. And then uh, those who are being accused of making Ta'atil are making Ifbat, though, aren't it? They're making Yeah, ifbat. yeah, yeah. So they're in, inshallah, both of them are in. They are in, that's right, that's right. But because it's a tennis court, they're both at the other side of the court, isn't it? They're in the court. They're both, alhamdulillah, within the court of yeah. the tennis court, but... They're, they're opposing ends, uh, you know. And so then th this debate is then a matter of what articulation do you prefer and why? Yeah. And what yeah. are the implications of, of the articulation? And I think just leave it at that. That's it. Yeah, you're right. It's I think that's probably, you know, how you're just going to be able to settle it, isn't it? Um, you know, one's a Federer, one's a Djokovic, you know. It's just how is how you it's, it's your temperament in it it's it's what you feel that that's 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 why i i think that going about it through the language route um might be a safer option in yeah i tend to think that it, like mm. what i think to my students is if you're not mastering the language then it's you you're just going to be saying well, i i support this because the hazard says so yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. like okay if, if if that's uh the level you want to function on, that's fine but otherwise, you know, it's just somehow I think if you can get both sides to transcend in, in, in a sense to see what both articulations were trying to do, you know, and if if you're if you're magnanimous enough, if you're generous enough to see what the people outside of the tent were trying mm. to do. <laughs> well, you know, read Ibn Hazm, read Sheikh al Islam and I'm, I'm not saying you, Mona, obviously you have, but I'm saying. And those of us who are sort of blinkered in, in, in when it comes to this issue, you see they have their own semantic theory. Ibn Hazm has got his own theory of language. Uh, Sheikh al-Islam has got his own theory of the language. And it's sophisticated. And they've, they've done just as much insightful tafsir as anyone else. Um, so, yeah, maybe your, reconcili your reconciliatory note will be a good <laughs> point maybe to end the session. I mean, it's it's... Yeah, it's 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 positive. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khairan, Mawlana, for always your input is so insightful, so helpful, so beneficial, and everyone your contributions. It just makes this session, you know, really, really enlightening. And obviously, everyone here has got the you know got the mentality which you know, it, we're not here for trying to draw battle lines. You know, we're just trying to understand a text, and you know not accusing hopefully we're not accusing anyone hopefully I, we, I haven't crossed or anyone in the audience hasn't come across as putting anyone else down um but all right it looks like again next week then we'll get to the hermeneutical rule we'll eventually get there we'll eventually get there so the hermeneutical rule of hujjat al-islam we'll get through um inshallah in our next session for those who want to read up on it it's in face of the i'll put my notes up on there as well uh, might be helpful.
Uh, Doc, you mentioned you had notes on the Sifat and stuff as well. Would you yes, yeah, I'll put them up. Yeah, 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 I'll put them up. I'll put them up, definitely. All right, how about it? Hmm. We shall uh, see you in our next session. Inshallah.